in the spirit of Twitter putting out white people against racism, I am going to criticize another work of art. And this is a work of art that I love, by the way. Beautiful novel that was made into a movie. Beautiful stuff. Um, and I enjoyed it. I loved it. I read the book. I saw the movie. We then read it a couple years later in school. To Kill a Mockingbird. Aesthetically, a great work. Just a great work of art. About the Old South. About Jim Crow and the injustice of it. But I am going to criticize it. That doesn't mean that I'm, I'm destroying your childhood you know, love for that book. It's a very beloved book. It's a young adult book, right? It's told from a child's perspective. It's a beautiful book, but, 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 politically it's problematic. Why? Folks, it takes place in the 1930s, right? Before the Second World War, during the Great Depression. The hero is a wealthy lawyer named Atticus Finch. And it's told from the perspective of his daughter, Scout. And he's a lawyer, and he defends an African-American man uh, who is charged with rape falsely. And he's charged with raping a white woman. And despite the fact that the evidence overwhelmingly shows that this black man is not guilty of rape, he's convicted of it. Um, and it's a tragedy. And it's, you know, it's a growing up story. The, do the girl is growing up in a world realizing that injustice exists. The, the, the Atticus Finch father character is portrayed as being, you know, just a man with a heart of gold. The whites in the book are portrayed as a bunch of racist rednecks. And that is the essence of the problem. During the 1930s, the slogan of the Communist Party USA, which was the vanguard of the anti-racist organization, before anyone had ever heard of Martin Luther King, Right? I mean, the Communist Party USA, that was, that was the party that W.E.B. Du Bois was in, uh, was friendly with. That was the party of Paul Robeson. That was the party of the Harlem Renaissance. That was the party of, of you know, I mean, that ran African Americans as vice presidential candidates. They were, they were the revolutionary. You can read, there's a book, Hammer and Ho, uh, History of the Communist Party of Alabama. Everyone knew that the Communist Party was the vanguard anti-racist organization. And what was the slogan of the Communist Party during the 1930s on regards to race? They said, black and white unite and fight. And the Communist Party made more progress in fighting racism. And the way they did it was they said, and they told white workers, that racism hurts you by, by stigmatizing and oppressing African Americans, by forcing African Americans to go to separate schools that are lower quality, by, by not allowing African Americans to drink out of the same drinking fountains, by, by you know, the lynch terror regime where any black man could be killed extra legally for any reason, right? You know, where they would just have these mobs of people who would just kill black men. That hurt white workers. That was the message the Communist Party had. They said, obviously, racism is the worst for the people of color, but for white workers, it's no good for them. And the way out is solidarity. It's black and white, unite and fight. And the Communist Party actually built labor unions that were interracial. That was illegal at the time, mind you. In South Carolina, in Alabama, in, in Tennessee, in places like that, the Communist Party built interracial unions of textile workers, you should read about the, the, the Gastonia textile strike of 1928. Uh, you should read about the 1934 uh, you know, sharecroppers strikes that happened. And the Communist Party, their message to the, the low-income white workers was that by joining in racism, you are helping the bosses. That was their message. And they, 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 the Communist Party did amazing things in the South during the 1930s. In 1934, they declared a state of emergency in South Carolina, and the, the National Guard was sent in because so many workers, white and black, were joining arm in arm together, demanding better conditions, demanding an end to Jim Crow segregation. But the way To Kill a Mockingbird portrays the race question is that it's the rich white people, the rich white people that are the friends of black people, and it's the white working class that are the racists and the rednecks. And that the educated white people, like Atticus Finch, who are wealthy, need to control those out-of-control rednecks. That's basically the message. And that's extremely problematic, and it's not what happened during the 1930s at all. Read Hammer and Ho. 
Read the history of the Communist Party. Read the memoirs of Angelo Herndon, one of the, the, the militant leaders of the Communist Party, an African-American man in Alabama. They tried to give him the death penalty just for handing out leaflets, right? They had a law in Alabama that it was illegal to incite black people to revolution. He was an African-American man. He was handing out leaflets saying, you know, the workers had to have a revolution, and they almost gave him the death penalty. Angelo Herndon. He was freed by the Supreme Court, thank goodness. But it was, it was a, I mean, the Communist Party in the South did amazing things amazing things. And they did it not by saying that the white workers are all in the Klan and we need these educated white rich people to come and, you know, tell, you know, fight for the black people and protect them from them, you know, those white trash rednecks. That wasn't the message at all. It was the rich white people that were the enemy. And the message was black and white unite and fight. And it was about solidarity. And that's how millions uh, millions of white workers were won to quit, to rip up their Ku Klux Klan cards. You can read about this, right? That, that they would, you know, that William Z. Foster or, or, you know, or Gus Hall would come to a town, you know, these were strong white workers and they would give a speech and, and white workers would just be in tears and they would realize that racism was something that ripped them out and they'd take their Ku Klux Klan membership card and they would rip it up. You know, that, that was what fought racism in the 1930s. Right? You know, it was black and white unite and fight. And the white workers weren't the enemy. The white workers weren't the enemy. And it wasn't the ruling class as a white savior protecting the black people from those racist whites. That was not what happened at all. That was not what happened at all. And, and the message of that book, the message of To Kill a Mockingbird, To Kill a Mockingbird was published in 1961, I believe. And the message of To Kill a Mockingbird is not what really happened in the 1930s in the South. The message of To Kill a Mockingbird is what, about what happened in the 1950s. It's about the civil rights movement. That's what it's about. It's about the civil rights movement, which was largely some of the richest people in the United States realizing that Jim Crow segregation hurt the United States economically and was a really, really p big problem in the face of the Soviet Union. In 1954, when Emmett Till was lynched, a young black man was killed for, for whistling at a white woman, allegedly. When that happened, um, you know, the Soviet Union took the picture, the photo of his body, and sent it all over the world and said, oh, the USA says they believe in democracy and freedom. Well, take a look at this picture, right? And there were the Kennedy family, and a lot of the northern wing of the Democratic Party, which was really, on some level, it was almost just a turf war because the Dixiecrats had been their rivals in the party for a long time. You know, the Dixiecrats, the solid south of the Democrats, the, they hated those folks. They couldn't stand them. The Kennedy family, these are Irish Catholics from the north. These are racist southern white guys and Klansmen in the south and the Democratic Party. The Kennedy family couldn't stand them. So it, it, you know, the fight against Jim Crow developed in the context of the Soviet Union using the race issue to humiliate and discredit the United States, number one, in the context of, of the, the Kennedy family and the northern wing of the Democratic Party being really, really tired and wanting to break the, the southern wing of the Democratic Party and strip them of their power because they were, they were corrupt and they had too much power and they, they, they made the Democratic Party do awful things. Um, for example, Harry Truman wanted to create national health insurance. Did you know that? Harry Truman wanted to create national health insurance. In the 50s, the, or like coming out of World War II, late 40s, Harry Truman was saying, let's get national health insurance. Let's give everyone national health insurance. And then they sat down with their own party, not the Republicans, but their own party. And the Southern guys were like, what? You mean we have to have the same? You're going to build two hospitals, right? We're going to have a black hospital and a white hospital. That's how we do things in Alabama. And Truman and the Northern Wing of the Democratic Party said, there's no way, no way we are going to build two hospitals if we're having to pay for it out of the federal budget. And it was the Dixiecrats, the racist Jim Crow Democrats that destroyed national health care. Racism is bad for all of us. It's most especially bad for people of color, but it's bad for all of us. The reason we don't have national health care right now is because of racism, right? The Jim Crow Democratic Party you know, when Truman and the Democratic Party were getting ready to, to pass national health care, national health insurance in the late 40s, the Jim Crow Democrats sat there and they said, the only way we're going to support this is if you build segregated hospital. And they weren't going to do that. Right. The, uh, and they were not going to they were not going to have it. Right. And that 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 Jim Crow hurt the Democratic Party and the Kennedy family knew that it, it, they knew it. It was a big problem. And. And so there, the civil rights movement took place in the context of a section of the ruling class 
a section of the most wealthy people in the United States, you know, kicking the ass of, of the southern wing of the ruling class that wanted to keep segregation. And, you know, that's what you see in To Kill a Mockingbird. Atticus Finch is a wealthy, educated man, and the people in his little southern town are a bunch of racist rednecks, and he's educated, and the way the black people are portrayed in the novel isn't particularly good either. You don't ever see them fighting for their own rights, you know? I mean, during that time, it was very common for the black people to take up arms against the Ku Klux Klan and form militias and defend themselves, but you didn't see that. That's not in the book. But it's this kind of white savior. The wealthy white savior goes to get those rabble rednecks in line, and it doesn't work, and it's so sad. And, and the book, you know, I mean, the book really plays into a white savior mentality, right? Atticus Finch is the wealthy, educated, good white person, right? And all the other whites, well, the white workers, are a bunch of uneducated white trash rabble, and then the black people are just victims, right? It's a problematic narrative. I mean, that wasn't the narrative of Martin Luther King. That wasn't the narrative, certainly, of, of Kwame Ture and, and Medgar Evers and a lot of the forces down there. But that was the narrative of white people who supported the civil rights movement. And To Kill a Mockingbird basically reflects the narrative of white people who supported the civil rights movement. And that's a problematic narrative. And it doesn't reflect what happened in the 1930s, which is the most untold story. The most untold story. Uh, of, of our time. What the Communist Party USA did in the 1930s is, is utterly amazing. I mean, you know, you, you need to read this history. The Communist Party, they are the ones that were beating the drum of anti-racism long before anybody else was, right? 1940, there's, I have video, I show it on my YouTube channel. James W. Ford, uh, was the vice presidential nominee of the Communist Party. He was their vice presidential nominee in 1932. He was their vice presidential nominee in 1936. He was their vice presidential nominee in 1940. James W. Ford, an African-American man. At the National Convention of the American Communist Party, Held in New York City in June of 1940, James Ford, the Communist Party candidate for the Vice Presidency of the United States, said... For the Negro in the South. My people, the Negro people of America, have in the Communist Party their best defender, the unfailing champion of, the, of their fall. I accept this nomination for Vice President of the United States. Let's also remember that up until 1956, the Communist Party didn't just say that, that you know, African Americans were discriminated against. The Communist Party actually maintained that African Americans were a nation. They were an oppressed nation within U.S. borders, right? And they, they argued that there was a black nation within the United States, a colonized people, right? Um, and that, I mean, you need to read this stuff, right? It wasn't until 1956 that the Communist Party officially dropped that position that black people were a nation, um, and, and so there's just so much that, that is missing today. So much that is missing.